Thank you. Welcome to IWF's fourth annual Women Lead Summit. Um, I'm Carrie Lucas, I'm the president of Independent Women's Forum, and I just want to first start by thanking everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here with us today, and that includes, we're going to have some people watching us by video, and we very much appreciate your time as well. IWF hosts this conference each year to bring together some of the leading women thinkers um, to discuss policy issues, encourage, talk, and find areas for collaboration. You know, IWF knows that all issues are women's issues, which means we have a whole lot to cover today. Um, and we have a great lineup. Um, in addition to the great panels and speakers, uh, we want to have a lot of time for everybody to talk and get to a little chance to network, because we know some of the most impressive women are around are people who are here in attendance. And so we really appreciate that and want to have um, time for everybody to, to get to meet each other. Um, but first up, I'm really um, thrilled to have with us, um, first, Patrice Anmuka, who is IWF's senior policy analyst. She's a fr frequent commentator on TV. She's worked for more on, on a decade uh, for, on issues um, affecting women and young people, including workplace regulations, technology, and criminal justice. And Patrice is going to be talking with our special guest, um, Rachel Campos Duffy, and uh, Congressman Sean Duffy is um, hoping to join in. He's coming over from the Capitol now. Um, now, Rachel was recently featured as an IWF modern feminist. You can get a full bio and picture um, if you come and visit IWF.org. But um, in summary, she is an author, commentator, and mother. She has a bachelor's degree from Arizona State University and a master's in international affairs from the University of California, San Diego. She met her husband, um, a Congressman Sean Duffy, while they were both starring on a reality television show. And <laughs> the Congressman is a prosecutor and former commentator. He currently serves on, on the House Financial Services Committee and is chairman of the Subcommittee on Housing and in Insurance. And we're just thrilled to hear from them and looking forward to uh, talking about everything from politics to almost most impressively juggling eight kids. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. That's right. And by the way, he's not here. They, they scheduled votes um, not very long ago, so he's rushing over, and um, that's a real sign of what life is like. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get into work like that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I was actually joking with Rachel that they are the first reality TV couple. They predate Heidi and Spencer. Yeah. So, um, this is a frame of reference for you know, what it means to be uh, in, in the public eye. And sure. two, decades later, two decades later, eight children, you know, what it means to now be prominent leaders in the conservative movement and in media. So we're just going to get right into it. Okay. Um, I want to know, tell us about the moment you met Sean. So what's interesting about the moment I met Sean is that it's actually captured on video. Like, isn't everybody? <laughs> um, so I did The Real World San Francisco, um, which was the third season of The Real World. And it's, it's hard to believe that it's been that long ago. And Sean did the fifth season. And right after the fifth season, the creators at MTV said, wouldn't it be great if we pick one person from each of the last five casts and we'll send them on a travel adventure show throughout the United States. And we ended up also going to New Zealand in the camper and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Here comes Sean. <laughs> and that's right. And that's how we met, um, basically, on that show. And the moment we met is actually captured on video. So it's kind of fun. Great timing, Congressman <laughs> Duffy. I mean, uh, I'd love to understand, how do you guys make your marriage work two decades later? Wow. Right to it, huh? <laughs> Listen, you know what? It's, it's, uh, it's crazy because uh, our schedule, I go back and forth to D.C. Uh, almost every week. Rachel's at home, we have eight kids, it's hard to be, I mean, you're a single mom with eight kids, it's not an easy uh, endeavor. Um, and she's been doing some Fox work, so sometimes I'm coming home and she's leaving. But we, we're not afraid to talk about things. I, I guess every, every marriage, some people say is a mystery, but marriages are hard. And if you don't actually talk and fight and argue and <laughs> navigate your relationship, um, I think they fall apart. Um, and so um, we do a good job of navigating our marriage and our kids and our family, and um, we talk all the time. I walk on the way to votes, I call her. I walk back from votes and I'll call her, so we might only talk for three minutes, but 
I try to stay in touch um, whenever I'm out here. Now I complain that when she is gone, she doesn't stay in touch with me. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> but I do stay in touch with her. So. Um, and I'm Latina, and I'm not allowed. I'm not afraid to speak my mind. So there's never any mystery about that. That's how for I sure. Feel She'll speak her mind. <laughs> in the marriage. So yeah, but I do think communication is a big part of it. Communicating to get our schedules to work better. Um, communicating about what's working and what's not working. I mean, you see people talk all the time about their careers and how do how, what do I do? And they strategize on their careers. I think we ought to spend as much or more time strategizing and talking about our marriages. Um, and in our case, we have eight other people depending on this unit working. Yeah. So um, there's a big responsibility to that. So um, we understand, and I think the motto of our marriage is um, our relationship comes first. And we have to make sure that everything is good with us, and then things will be better with the kids. But if we put the kids first, and this falls apart in the end, it all falls apart. So that's something we try to, now, it's like everything in life, it's constantly recalibrating and, and finding that balance. And sometimes that balance isn't there and you gotta come back to it, but it's always trying to find that center, which is marriage first, then the kids, and, and, and trying to work it out that way. I'll just say too, I th we, we do a good job of helping each other out, so I wouldn't be here in Congress without her. Um, she's kind of the brains behind the operation. Um, <laughs> but also I help, I help her with her stuff, so she's, she's you know doing, um, a segment on Fox, uh, and there's a topic that I might know more about because of my job, and I, I'm helpful with her. I also book her flights and her hotel. <laughs> I'm her scheduler. Um, I need an assistant. I'm her travel Until agent. I, get one. <laughs> I am the assistant. She's better at that part. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. Well, I mean, uh, Rachel, what's interesting is you were a finalist for the Dreamworks three different times. Yeah. Um, and it, it didn't end up working out, but you ended up going moving to Wisconsin and having a family and doing right. that route. It was an amazing lesson. So the first time I was up for it, um, and I didn't get it. I really thought I was going to get it, and I didn't get it. Um, and I sort of thought, like, okay, well, I'm kind of in between gigs here. I'm, I live in Wisconsin, but I'm going to get this thing going again, you know. And um, and then they called me back, um, and had when Lisa Ling left, and they said, come back, and we want you to audition again. And, I, and again, I made it to the finals, um, and it was between myself and Elizabeth Hasselbeck. And when I didn't get it, um, I was disappointed, but not the way I was the first time. And that, that, because at this point, I had had two kids. I was pregnant with my third. And I think it really, I, I really sort of had a, a, a bit of a spiritual moment, if you will, where I was like, you know what? I think I'm actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing, which is being home with my kids at this time. Um, I was an at-home mom for 14 years. Um, and I think that was the right decision for me and my family. Now, during that time, I was doing other things. I was writing articles, and I was doing other things. Um, and then I reached a point um, uh, about four or five years ago where I decided I wanted to go and work for Libra Initiative, um, and that's when I was a colleague of yours. Um, uh, but I, I think that um, it, it's, it was a, a good learning experience for me, and one of the things that I learned when I had made the decision to be home was how not supported I felt by the sort of feminist community, um, by, by supposedly my sisters um, out there. And I just really felt like what I was doing was not being valued. I started to write about it. And eventually, I, uh, after writing a lot of articles about it, I ended up writing a book about it. Um, but that was uh, something that I really made me very keenly aware of the need for organizations like yours that support women, whatever their choices are. And that became something that w I realized was missing um, for me, and I needed to find those, those other women who were going to support me in my decision. Can, can, can I answer that, too? Yeah, please. About how I made it so well, as I said, stay-at-home mom. Um, <laughs> I, I think what's, I mean, Rachel said she was at home for 14 years, which is actually, it was true, but also, even now, you're still an at-home mom. I mean, she gets to work for Libre, but gets to do a lot of that from home. She gets to, I mean, she gets to do Fox from, you know, Wausau, Wisconsin, and having eight kids and still being able to travel out and work our schedules. But for the most part, it doesn't, you don't, you don't have eight kids and have two, like, full-time, eight to five or six parents working. Um, it actually works because she's able to stay home and then leave, and I'm coming home and... Yeah, it's a you crazy know, it's, schedule. It's not a, it's, just to be well, clear, it's not your work. Well, I would say that technology kind of caught up with, 
what I wanted to do as well. So I lived in a town that didn't have a satellite. So how could I work for Fox from my hometown and do a, a hit at eight o'clock? There was no satellite. Two years ago, we got a satellite. So um, that stuff kind of started to work out. But I also had to talk to Fox and go, hey, I think you guys could really use me. I, I live in the middle of America. I'm not on the coast. I created a, a I, I let them know that I, what I was doing, what I could offer. And like I said, technology caught up. We spoke earlier, Patrice, you and me and Tammy, we talked about what it was like to be an at-home mom in the 50s versus now. I mean, it's just not the same experience. And I think that the feminist movement hasn't caught up with how that's changed, that you can be an at-home mom um, or a part-time at home mom and be as connected as any of the journalists at the Washington Post because you have the internet um, and you you have the same access to information. So um, life is changing, technology is changing, and um, in many ways it's making being a mom um, a, a lot less isolating and a lot more interconnected. And I think that's really great advice for young women, particularly millennials or younger women who are in college thinking about their careers, that they can actually balance family and career and still do well because of things like Right. Look, I'll never be, you know, Barbara Walters. I'll never have that career at, at, with uh, the amount of stuff that I have on my plate. But I don't want to be Barbara Walters. So you have June Cleaver here, you have Barbara Walters here, and there's miles of space in between. And we can find that place that works for us. And I think that's what women are asking um, of the feminist movement is make space for everything in between. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So to shift gears just a little bit. Sure. Um, with thinking about the America First agenda, you guys were both very, very ardent and early supporters of candidate Trump and now President Trump. Um, you know, Sean, I would love for you to talk about three bright spots you've seen in this administration, and then maybe a couple of areas where you'd love to see more improvement. It was a lonely time uh, during <laughs> the uh, uh, pro-Trump candidate uh, movement. Uh, <laughs> Listen, so talk about three bright spots. Bright spots. Um, maybe I'll even talk about more than that. So I look at American energy independence. Um, the fact that we've had a, a fracking revolution take place in America. The fact that we're you know, going to continue to explore you know, offshore, that we're going to build pipelines to transport uh, energy um, across our country is amazing. I love when I fill up my vehicle in Wausau, Wisconsin. My dollars don't go to some people in the Middle East that hate me. They actually go to North Dakota. North Dakotans like us. I love that they get my money. It's a great thing. So energy independence. I, I, uh, I look at what's happened with, with North Korea. We've, each, each administration, though Republican and Democrat, get the same advice from the same experts, the same intelligentsia. And though there are different parties and different presidents, they get the same result. Nothing changes. In here, I gotta tell you, I was nervous, but when Donald Trump is calling, you know, Kim Jong Un, little rocket man, and my button's bigger than yours, and my button works, and fire and fury, I'm like going, oh my God, we're gonna have a, where's this going? But you know what? He was he was leveraging what he uh, has in America and the strength of our country and the fact that we weren't gonna be bullied into. I mean, I don't know how this. I mean, the North Koreans are liars and they're cheaters, so I don't know how this plays out. But you have. Three, uh, three captives coming home uh, on an airplane right now with Mike Pompeo. Pretty great, isn't it? <laughs> Kim Jong-un uh, went into South Korea. I mean, this is histor really historic stuff. And by the way, if you look at what the options were that President Trump inherited, there, there are really two options. Number one, you allow the North Koreans to have nuclear weapons with, uh, with missiles that can reach anywhere in the world. That's a really frightening scenario. The second option was we take out their nuclear weapons, and they they were very smart. They built they they have a whole slew of conventional weapons, and you can't take all of them out. So if we went for their nukes, they launch their conventional weapons, and hundreds of thousands of people die on the Korean Peninsula, and even over into Japan. It was a you, there, there was no good solution, um, no matter what way you looked. And here, President Trump has leveraged a potential for peace on the Korean Peninsula. It's remarkable. That, um, I'll also look at, uh, at uh, what he's doing with renegotiating the deal on NAFTA and tariffs on China. I'm a free trade guy. I believe in free trade. I believe our economies prosper and grow when we reduce barriers um, and um, have this competitive environment. And if we have that free trade, I think Americans win because we're, we're the hardest working, most productive 
um, most innovative people. But it's not fair trade. I mean, the fact that China has barriers to trade for our manufactured goods when we actually open ourselves up for all of their manufactured goods, well, that's not fair. Or the fact that an American company, when they want to go to China to manufacture, we have to turn over all of our intellectual property and our patents, give them to the Chinese. No wonder they've made such advancements technologically against the United States. It's totally unfair. And so if Donald Trump doesn't deal with that today, how do you deal with China 10 years from now when their economy is that much bigger, their military is that much more powerful? You can never deal with it. And so though it's a painful, I mean, it's a hard, I mean, I think this is, no one wants a trade war. But I do think you have to deal with the inequities in trade. And President Trump's been unafraid to do that, even with, with uh, NAFTA, making sure that, you know, I have, I have people that used to work in factories in my communities. They made 35 bucks an hour. Those factories have gone away. Now they make $14 an hour. These are huge standards of living changes that have happened, not necessarily because someone's more competitive, but because of the way we set up our trade and our tax codes. In changing those things, I think you're going to see a revolution in American um, manufacturing again. Jobs that people said were gone forever, I think, are now going to come back. I, well, they already are. I mean, they already are. We're Thank you. That. I mean, and I would say when I think about the bright spots, I, I say I voted for Donald Trump for security and prosperity reasons. Because I'm a mom, and that's what we think about. And um, I, on security, it looks like he's delivering. I'm happy with what's happened with ISIS. Um, I don't know what the solution of Syria is, but I knew for a fact I wanted somebody to take out ISIS. Um, and I wish that the president would get some credit for, I mean, ISIS had female sexual slavery. And the women's movement has given no credit to Donald Trump for taking on the one caliphate, the one organization who was bragging about having and openly trading women um, as cattle. Uh, so he's not getting credit for that. Um, he did take down ISIS. We're almost done with them. And now he's doing something that I think is also going to impact the world um, with North Korea. And we'll see what happens with Iran. Um, in terms of prosperity, we're seeing it in Wisconsin. I don't know if you can see it if you're in Washington, D.C., where things have been going pretty good <laughs> um, for the people who live here um, and on the coast. But in middle America, they were forgotten. And it was no surprise to us, you know, when all the people I knew in D.C., many of them conservatives who were certain that Hillary Clinton was going to win, I, I, they thought I was crazy. I was like, Donald Trump's going to win because I could feel what was happening. People wanted someone to take a wrecking ball to this system. Um, they wanted somebody to think different. They wanted, you know, one of the things I kept hearing about was they wanted somebody that didn't owe anybody anything. <laughs> and Donald, they, people really believed that with Donald Trump, that he had no, no skin in the game. It, you know, he's already rich. Um, nobody in Washington liked him. He was just going to do it because he wanted to do the right thing. And if you go into the Midwest, the factories are coming back. You cannot find a construction worker <laughs> to do anything because construction is booming. Um, industries that the Democrats told us were gone forever, manufacturing, blogging, mining, um, dirty fingernail jobs, these things that they told us would never come back, and the Democrats said, forget about it. Um, it's going to China. It's going to Mexico. Um, it's coming back, and it's amazing. And um, it's sad that if you watch the, you know, if you watch the mainstream media, the legacy media, um, you will never hear about it or not hear about it in the volume that it I think frankly deserves. But people in the Midwest where, where we live, they're feeling it. Yes, on, the, on the downside, I, so uh, we, we kind of see ourselves as Wisconsin nice. We're really nice people. Um, <laughs> th that's different than New York. So we don't tweet like the president tweets. We, we don't say things the way he says it. Um, and so I think that can be perceived by some is not a positive, but I would say that people are also pleased that he pushes back and fights back with the media that usually is abusive to conservatives. He's kind of led the way and taught Republicans how to actually fight back and push back um, and not just be abused and treated unfairly by the media. Uh, so I think that th that's a, may, maybe a wash, good and bad. I do think there's an issue with, I mean, the, the Stormy Daniel story, I think there's a lot of women in my district who say, well, I never voted for him because of his values or, or they're not surprised by the story. I never supported him for that reason. I supported him for other reasons. But I do think that that doesn't necessarily send the best message. Um, 
you know, I, he's, I, I think Melania is fantastic, and you look at what was going on in, in that respect, or even the Billy Bush tapes. On the, on the downside, I think that is, um, that's a problem. That's a problem for him, and um, so it's a weight around his neck, and especially as a party, we need to win more women. That doesn't really help us out. And it becomes kind of a distraction from a lot of the good rights stuff yeah. that you Absolutely. mentioned. I mean, I, what I love that you guys touched on is this is the exact opposite of what Hillary Clinton said is happening in middle America. She said that the, where she won was optimistic, diverse, dynamic, and moving forward, which would mean rural America is pessimistic, homogenous, static, and falling behind. And you're proof that that's actually not happening, that we're seeing a lot of great progress across the country. But one area that I think rural America is being hit by is the opioid crisis. And I think this is one of those areas that both Congress as well as the administration is really laser focused on. Um, Congressman Duffy, please talk about the, the human impact, both on families and children, but also um, civil servants who are dealing with this crisis. So it's, it's, uh, it's in our communities, but I think in communities all across America, opioids, uh, heroin, meth are ravaging our communities. Um, and just if you look at the issues that stem from it, the, so we have, we have, we're, we're pretty poor, we're pretty rural, um, we, our counties don't have a lot of money, and if you look at, I mean, law enforcement will say they'll, they'll, they'll come up to um, a dealer's house, and the kids will be locked in the back seat of the car as the parents are passed out, because they had just shot up needles still in them in the front seat, and these kids are just locked in car seats, they can't get out. Stories of kids um, who are locked into the basement for days, um, as their parents are upstairs shooting, and they'll take basically cereal and just dump the cereal on the floor for their two and a half year old to eat off the floor. What's happened is some of the law enforcement have said they've actually started to drink more because of what they're seeing is so disturbing across these you know rural police departments. We're spending our our, our county budgets are getting blown because blown. I mean, just we don't have the resources because of the out-of-home placements for these kids. We're taking them away from their parents and putting them in out-of-home placements. That costs money. And the cost of that has been so extreme. Um, and, and I think our small communities are, and our, all of our communities are trying to figure out, how do we deal with this? What's happening in our country that are, that, that are, that, that's making people or encouraging people to make the choice of using drugs that you use one time? And, and you're hooked, you're addicted. I've, I've um, got a friend who was telling a story about a high-functioning, very successful individual who did heroin once. And after he did it, he said, I knew that I wanted to do this every day of my life until I died. It was so good. And he got really good at lying until he... But so two things on, on what we have to do. People might talk about immigration and the southern border in a lot of different realms. 95% of these drugs come across the southern border. So securing the southern, bo southern border is a key strategy to dealing with um, the, uh, the, the drug addiction problem that we have in our country. And again, supply and demand would be very helpful. Let's, let's cut off, the, let's cut off uh, the supply, drive up the prices, great. Make it harder for people to get the drugs. Let's just not roll back and say, hey, great, let them roll in and whoever's gonna use it is gonna use it and make sure it's you know, cheaper than a pack of cigarettes. I mean, come on. So there's that part of it. Um, and then we have to recognize that this is not dealing with, you know, if you have an, if someone who has a drinking problem, there's a, there's a cost and a process that we go through to help people with alcoholism. The cost to treat people who have become addicted to these incredibly um, challenging drugs, it takes a lot more money, a lot longer inpatient treatment. We need different facilities, different resources. Um, if we're gonna help make, help people turn the corner from addiction to recovery. I spoke to a, um, a he was a former addict who actually recovered and, and actually his, his son became addicted and ended up dying and he feel, felt a lot of guilt for that, but he's now a counselor. He said, I said, well, what's the solution? And he said, well, we need more money for, for, the re, for the rehabilitation or the detox or whatever. But he said, the main problem is that you need, after you get off the drug, you need six months to a year far away from wherever it was that you were that you got addicted. You need that much, he said, six months at least, preferably a year. So that is really the challenge, is that's very expensive to take people away from their community and put them somewhere where they can learn to live 
without that influence, without the enablers, whatever that, that is that's happening. Um, but I think at its very, very core, um, there's clearly a spiritual problem in this. There's, a, there's, it, there's an addiction problem and we have a spiritual family problem in this country. And I think you know, all problems in this country come down to the family. And um, of course, there's going to be cases of people, somebody threw out their back and, and somehow got addicted to the opioids. But there are other things happening in our country that could be solved um, by having stronger families. And I think being married to somebody who's in, you know, involved in public policy, whatever we do um, needs to be things that are, uh, the policies that are in place ought to be policies that build up families, that make them stronger, um, and don't incentivize um, some of the breakdowns we've seen because it becomes even harder to help someone in these situations when there's a family breakdown. This, I, I, there's a debate now about do we legalize marijuana? And I'm sorry, as a, a parent of eight, and I was a prosecutor too, people in your community has used marijuana. Um, and from my perspective, if you're dealing marijuana, I had a problem with that as a prosecutor. If someone was using marijuana, you kind of, we're not, we weren't charging them criminally, they had to get a city citation. There was a little bit of, we get what goes on in societies. But don't we think our kids have enough problems to face with, I mean, I don't know, anyone have teenage kids? Or just maybe, they, I mean, they're taking pictures of themselves and like they go to a party together and they text each other on the same couch. I'm like, what the hell, what's going on? And, <laughs> So, I mean, I think there's, I think there's a detachment that's, take, that's taking place. There's a lack of bonding because of our phones today. I think you look at from pornography to bullying and all the drugs you already have there. Why would we say, I want one more pressure for my kids to legalize marijuana? And it's one thing to go, yeah, they might use it. But to say, as a society, we're going to say it's okay? I just, I have, a, I have a real problem with that. And I believe the status, you're three times more likely to become addicted to these harder drugs through marijuana then It's a um, gateway drug. And I know there's a lot of controversy about it. Um, we're old school. I can't, I'm kind of old school Like my grandpa. <laughs> Sorry. So. And my kids will argue against me like, well, dad, everyone, everyone in high school doesn't agree with you. I'm like, well, I probably, but sorry. <laughs> I'm on my rocking chair with my pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no more barring people because they have different ideas. I mean, that's wacky. You don't have to agree with Trump, but the mob can't make me not love him. I mean, that is insane, apparently. Um, what do you guys make of this? Uh, not just Kanye West, but the idea of Chance the Rapper saying black people don't have to be Democrats. What do you make of maybe, is this a tipping point? What do you make of this? I actually think it's a, it, in about five years from now, I think we're going to see this as a bigger moment um, than we kind of right now understand. I've been speaking around the country about the intersection of pop culture and politics for a long time. Maybe one of these days you guys can bring me back to give that talk because it's one of my favorite talks. And Sean and I kind of enter politics in a really different way. And um, we never mocked pop culture because at one point we were really part of it. And we also, having been raised on a reality TV show, if you will, or come of age in, in one, we understand its power. Um, and a lot of Republicans are, were very intellectual and fact-based, and a lot of Republicans and conservatives tend to look down on pop culture. I've always understood its power, and so when Donald Trump started running, I was like, wow, this is gonna change things. I didn't know it was gonna change. I didn't know it was as big as Kanye, but I realized it was gonna change things, and I saw it really early on when he was running. You remember when he had that moment where he, uh, wanted to prove that Hillary was like very physically frail, but boy, he had a great physical. Do you guys remember where he or where he presented his medical physical from his doctor that said he was like the healthiest human being on the planet? Do you guys remember that? <laughs> he went to Dr. Oz. He went on to Dr. Oz. And at that moment, if you look back at my tweets, I tweeted, finally, we have a Republican candidate who understands the power of pop culture because he was trying to reach uh, moms, moms, a lot of moms were reaching, suburban moms were watching, um, and he knew if he went on Dr. Oz, it was going to go on to E and all the other, you know, uh, entertainment news, and so I felt like he's somebody who understands it because he is a creature of pop culture. So Barack Obama, 
you know, he was kind of cool by association. He associated with Beyonce, and, but all of that happened, you know, after he became the most powerful man in the free world, right? But Donald Trump was friends with Kanye before he was president. Donald Trump was in rap songs um, before he was president. Um, he always wanted to be in pop culture, and he had this built-in huge audience from The Apprentice. So he, this constant tweet, I mean, think about it. Uh, Barack Obama had really, really smart Silicon Valley techie guys doing his tweets. Do any of you guys remember any tweets from Barack Obama? Grandpa Donald Trump does his own tweeting and it moves the news cycle. How many times, Tammy, have you been on a show on Fox where we're, we think we're saying something really important and they say, sorry, we have to break in. Breaking news, Donald Trump just tweeted, whatever. Um, so he moves the news cycle. He understands social media and pop culture on a level that has never been seen before. And my only hope is, and, and, and a lot of people criticize him for, you know, the, I love it. And I, maybe I'm crazy, I kind of like it. And I think more Republicans and more conservatives ought to learn from him how, because I think what people like about him is he's authentic. Love him or hate him, you know what he's thinking almost at, e it's almost scary <laughs> at every moment. And I think it's changing the way um, we view pol politics and the way we view politicians. I think that the talking points coming out of the RNC are dead. I think what people want to know from the person they're going to vote for is what do you really think and be honest with me. And okay, that's but, where I think we're at. Uh, but on Kanye, I think it's amazing that I, I, I guess I'm, I, really, I really am kind of getting out of pop culture. Maybe I'm in the bubble. but. Not a big Kanye follower, uh, but I'm amazed. You look at you look at Kanye is going to save free thought in America. Really, I mean, the weekend that you that that that, a, that an African American and Hispanic women women they can't they they're not allowed to think outside of the Democrat orthodoxy because of of their race and their gender. And and Kanye is like, hold up a second, I'm a free thinker. I'm allowed to think what I want, and I can agree with part and disagree with another part. I'm not going to be put in a box. And that he's driving culture, kind of saying, it's OK to be a free thinker. Because Donnie and I have dragon energy, is what he said, which is crazy. <laughs> I'm like, and what is dragon energy? But, but did you see that? In one week, the African-American male approval rating doubled, doubled for from, Donald Trump. And that's still in low, one. but from 11 to 22 um, <laughs> percent. It's probably. <laughs> But but Kanye is. I mean, isn't it great that this guy is saying, "I want to. I don't. I, I want to be able to think for myself. Why do other people have to tell me what I have to think and what party I have to be part of and what candidate I have to support? I'm my own man. I want to. I want to think for myself. And that he's 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 getting slaughtered um, because I don't think I don't think the liberal elite can allow Kanye to be a free thinker. They need Kanye to still be in, in the progressive movement because if Kanye can step outside, someone who they've celebrated, who I mean, has touched all parts of society, if he can be a, be a free thinker, oh my gosh, well, anyone can be a free thinker then, right? And if I think it's, if Kanye is cool and he's a free thinker, maybe I should be cool too and be a free thinker as well and make up opinions for myself. I think, I, as Rachel said, I think this is revolutionary uh, for but what it, he's doing because he's cracking the mold. But it did start with Donald Trump. I think. Yeah. I think the thing with Donald Trump is, and it, and it goes to Kanye, is I don't think they hate Donald Trump as much as they feared him. And I think the same thing, you know, you see the fear that him. was happening with Kanye stepping out because um, you know that as a minority, I know that. Tammy, you know that as a, a, a gay woman, that if you step out, the punishment is unique. Um, it's... It's bad for, you know, if you were a Trump supporter, you got called a racist, you got called a kind of thing. There's a unique punishment for those of us um, that are minorities who step outside of what they say we can think. My chief, my, my, chief, my chief of staff is gay. He left me and went and ran Trump for Wisconsin, and we won Wisconsin. Um, the hate he got back when he got back to D.C. Um, from his, his the community of friends, in quotes, there is a special... Punishment if you step outside and to give that kind of support and, and it was really hard on him I mean, withstand, I mean, we've made a decision years ago that we were willing to take that But there are a lot of people 
who think like us or at least part of what we believe and have held back because it, it feels scary to step out. I think Kanye is giving permission for that. We'll see where it goes. We'll yeah, see where it goes. And I think you guys are touching on a great point as we kind of wrap up our conversations is so good. But, you know, the idea that there's a special place in hell for women who don't dot, dot, dot. Right. Um, the feminist movement is kind of overtaken by this, this, uh, this narr victimization narrative, number yes. one, but also this group thing where if you don't think or vote a certain way, Michelle Obama couldn't pick fathom how women didn't vote for, for Hillary Clinton. She just said it this past weekend. And so when we talk about, you know, just women and conservative women in particular, Rachel, you were prominent, you were the public eye. What does it look like? How do you respond to the backlash that you receive Um, so I really, I have a thick skin. I mean, so I, I, you know, I came from reality TV when, since I was 22. I always say I have the skin of an elephant. It just rolls off me. I'll tell you one thing that concerns me. I was on Fox News um, on the weekend doing a show, and all of a sudden it came out that Jay-Z had said something bad about Barack Obama. I think he, I mean, about uh, Donald Trump. He said he was a super bug. And I was just, and I said, well, what the heck has Jay-Z ever done for black people? I mean, look at Donald Trump has lowered the unemployment for black people and what, but anyway, I hit a nerve with what I learned was called the Bayhive. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Beehive. <laughs> and so Beyonce and Jay-Z have this online community. I didn't know about this. I'm old. I'm in my 40s. Um, who are very supportive of them. And from the moment, and this was towards the end of the show, so I, I leave the studio and I immediately get in my car to go to the airport because I gotta go to, back to Wisconsin. From the time it took me to leave the studio to get to the airport, my social media exploded with the most vile, some of it violent, sexual, I had to take pictures of some of it in case, you know? It was, and they, what they tried to do is they infect every single post you ever made because what they want to do is force you to just shut your account down. So as soon as I got to the airport, I called a friend of ours from Libre who manages, you know, who understands social media much more than I do. I'm one of those asking their kids all the time. And he said, you have to shut it down. I'm like, I'm not shutting it down. I said, I am not going to let them win. And I went through and I took pictures of everything that was the most vile. I tried to keep what I could. Um, I, I tried to delete the rest of it. And um, I didn't shut it down. But that's what they want to do. And I will tell you, at one point, it was so bad that somebody actually commented, um, you guys, this is getting really bad. She's going to kill herself. And then somebody posted, I hope she does. Now, I'm 46 years old. I, I, I can take it. But imagine if you're 14 and you're stepping outside or you're 16 or you're 20 and that kind of social media bullying because you have a different opinion than somebody else can be very intimidating. It was a real eye opener for me. I have met throughout, um, as I give talks, I have met so many young minority girls, um, especially Hispanic girls, who have been bullied at their school. One of them came out, she was in high school, came out as a Trump supporter um, on social media. She was the president of the UN club. Everybody in the club quit to show their protest, so she was the president of nobody, nothing. Um, these kinds of things happen to young girls all the way on up, and um, I, all I can do is be strong and show that you can survive this <laughs> and um, continue to move forward because I am not gonna let them shut my social media down. I am not gonna let them tell me what I can and cannot think, and that's just, can, that's I can only control myself. Not shut it. I try to shut her down too, and I'm not successful sometimes. Because she, I know, I know, we're, we're going to end now. I know, but just, and I don't know if you guys are talking about this. One, one space I, that we did not touch on that also is a cross section of politics and culture is guns. And I have a very, and I'm, and I'm not going to make a long comment, but we, we have, I have, a, I have a pro gun district. I have a pro um, NRA district, and I have seen what's happened with moms in in my district. They are moving on this issue. When you see kids die in school and you compare that to the Second Amendment rights and how that has been thought about and how moms and women think about guns, I think that's a broader conversation that we have to have and think through the policy and the conversation um, and the changes that might have to be made. But a bunch of women, so I had to bring that up. So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you for doing really good